here with American songwriter. We had the opportunity to talk to Mike Main of Mike Main and the Branches. Adam was able to talk to Mike over the phone. Check out his new song, Gonna Get Through This, that he wrote and recorded during quarantine. Make sure to check out our YouTube channel and Facebook page at Bringing It Backwards and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bringing Back Pod. We'd appreciate your support if you follow and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We're Bringing It Backwards with Mike Main. Hey, how's it going, Adam? Great. How are you? I'm great, dude. I'm great. Cool. Well, I, I guess Tara told you what the podcast is about, um, so... I'll just start uh, from the top. I wanted to know, uh, you are you guys from Michigan? You're from Michigan originally? Yeah, originally from Michigan. Band started there. And my, my wife and I, so we're the founding members of the band, Shannon and I. And then we, we have a group out of Charlotte. So that's kind of like our core bandmates. They all live down there. But uh, Shannon and I moved to Nashville back in October to to just continue pursuing our dream of making music but I'm also a songwriter so I write for and with other artists and as well as a producer so I've been doing kind of a, a combination of pursuing the band as well as uh, some other opportunities too and uh, we love it down here that's awesome yeah, we were supposed to go out there actually next month, but due to COVID and everything, uh, our our plans got canceled. So hopefully soon we will be out to Nashville. <laughs> but yeah, uh, man. Yeah, I know it sucks. We're supposed to, to be out here next month. Get out here. Yeah, we'd love to. That'd be awesome. So okay, so you you're born and raised in in Michigan. Tell me about like getting into music. What were you, what was the first instrument you learned how to play? Yeah, first. The first one was drums, and I had zero interest in becoming a songwriter or front man of, of any kind. <laughs> I was always just attracted to drummers. I think maybe maybe it was the rage. It felt like a good way to get some cardio in and also hit stuff really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my dad was not keen on the drum set idea probably because he wanted a good night's sleep sure which you can't blame him for <laughs> and then yeah eighth grade rolled around and that's when i got i was introduced to poetry and adjectives and verbs and really understanding the way that they could electrify language and mm -hmm. you could take what you're feeling on the inside and put it you could squeeze all those little feelings into words and those words could be amplified in a way that kind of shined a light on a particular subject and other people who felt similar emotions could slowly crawl out of, you know, their case and go, Oh man. Yeah. I feel the same way. And that was when the idea that I could communicate like that was first born in my mind and and so my poetry got published and that's where i sort of slowly made the shift from drummer to songwriter because my uh just just that that uh, that experience and then singing um so it's kind of like well i, I i've got these lyric ideas these melodies and i mm -hmm. need an accompaniment and uh i just had this beat up old guitar uh that it, i'd inherited as a kid and I never played. And so of course it's like, you just pull it out of the closet, blow the <laughs> dust off and there you try go. to learn how to play some like teen spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so eighth grade, you started writing poetry. Um, you said you had your post, uh, one of your poems published. Yeah. Several. Wow. Um, Tell that me about year. That. That's and cool. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And then later, my dad told me I had poems published when I was in p kindergarten, I think, which I don't, I don't even remember. I, I couldn't even tell you what it was. Um, <laughs> but it, all, all those, those instances were striking to me and developmental because I was horrible at sports. 
which wasn't great for my self-esteem, but being surprised by poetry and seeing those, you know, poems find a, find a place and, and it helped me to go, Oh, wow. Well, maybe I, I have a, a skill set. You know, I, I, I am worthwhile, even though I can't catch a football, uh, <laughs> Yeah. I can I can sing songs, I can write poetry. So mm-hmm. um yeah, yeah, that's how that all came together. When did you start putting the the words and the poems and stuff to to music and like actually writing songs? Yeah, that would have been middle of well, it would have been about January of my eighth grade year of high school. So I I took this choir class because all my friends who are a year or two older than me said, take that. It's an easy A. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll take this easy A class. Well, the, the exam for that class was to sing. So I had to pick a song and perform it for the class. And that was terrifying. I'd never done that. <laughs> and I sang drop the Jupiter by train. Okay. And, made all the girls in the class blush <laughs> and my teacher pulled me aside and said, that was incredible. I got an A plus and I'm like, okay, well I can use my voice and then I, I can scribble words onto a paper. I, I should smash these two things together. And, th- and that's where it all, it all started to happen. Wow. And then did you start a band or were you doing writing these songs and performing them at coffee shops or open mic nights? Yeah, I started I started a band in eighth grade with my best friend at the time, Shane Roosevelt, and convinced my friend Dave, who was who lived down the road from me, to buy a drum set, even though he didn't even know how to play drums, <laughs> uh, to be the drummer because then because we needed I was a drummer and Shane was a guitar player, but we needed a bass player, so I convinced my buddy Dave to play drums so I could play bass and. We we had this little band and we never played any shows, but we would just play play after school for a few hours. And then my first serious band happened my sophomore year of high school, and that would remain my kind of my main focus and my main project until about the first year I was out of high school. And that was like breaking up with the girl you thought you were going to marry. It was a really painful mm-hmm. time, but then. But I laid it down for a really, really long time. I, I think I left that band when I was 19 and I, you know, 19 to 21 is a, is a long amount of time, you know, when you're that young. Uh, and it was only, yeah, two years later that I'd went through some pretty traumatic experiences that I started opening up my guitar case again and, mm-hmm. and writing. And, um, I made a, I, I recorded a demo for my pastor's wife who they, um, I kind of glossed over a lot of details, but I moved in with my pastor's family, uh, when I was 19, cause I had a pretty traumatic upbringing and they sort of took me in and mm-hmm. adopted me. And I wrote his wife a song for mother's day and recorded it. Mm-hmm. And then like, 12 other songs in the same night with, with this friend that I made at church. And he just, he had pulled me aside and said, listen, man, like you need to be doing this. Like, this is what you were put on earth to do. You should be pursuing this full time. So that was where it all like really started to change for me as far as like recognizing that I, you know, maybe I will pursue this again. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started not long after that, I, I relocated to Texas and, and started what would become this band, Mike Means in the Branches and ha- haven't looked back since, man. I haven't wow. looked back. What was the, the reason that you chose Texas to, to move to Texas? Yeah. So my, my little sister had moved down there and I was living outside of Lansing, Michigan at the time. And I was going through a bit of a faith crisis and was, was a part of this church where it's kind of like, if you're going through a faith crisis, you know, you're, 
you're dancing on the edges of hell's gates or something. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I needed a, I needed a bit of a, a recess and I, I needed to be in a, in a place I wasn't familiar with so that I could kind of dive deep and do, do a lot of work internally to sort a lot of those issues out like guilt and shame and, and what are the, what, what are those things? Why do I experience them? How do I process them? So yeah, that, that drove me down to Texas. I got a job at a casino working third shift. Um, and I scribbled out what would become our first record just on little pieces of paper while I walked around the casino cashing people's jackpots. Really? And yeah, yeah. And formed a band down there. My wife was still in Michigan and we would send ideas back and forth to each other. And then eventually the band relocated to Michigan we made our first record and that's where it all really kind of, we started making waves and mm. we're getting wind and done by record labels. And wow. uh, one of whom was tooth and nail who we, we, we later signed with and mm. um, just kept putting out music touring. And, you know, it's been about 10 years and we, we've managed to, to be able to make this our, our job. And it's something we're extremely grateful for. You know, you, I, I'm, I'm an artist, so it's easy for me to, to compare myself to, to what someone else has. And, you know, there are some days where I wake up, I'm like, I can't believe that this is my life. And other days where I'm like, man, a few million more fans would be great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm, as I get older and, 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 just focus on my work. I, I realize how much of a privilege privilege it is to that that the what I love to do is also my job, you know, and uh I get to do it my best friend. So I'm yeah, I'm just deeply, deeply grateful. Yeah. How did you meet your wife and was she, were you guys playing songs together before you ended up moving to Texas? Yeah, yeah, we were. So we met when I was still with my first band in high school, her band and it was, was playing some shows with us. And I, I was always, anytime her band would, would, would play, I was, was like glued to her <laughs> and not, 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 not entirely in a like romantic way. Like I want to make out with this girl. It was more like, she was just so intriguing to me. She would wear, she wore these like tap tap shoes and she would like tap dance, but she'd also play keyboard. She also sang. She also played the saxophone. So she was like this, like expression, like expressionist, like her, her art was so, and her stage presence was so theatrical. I, it just drew me in because I could tell that it was, it was, it was like poetry and it was so sincere Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just wanted to, I want to know everything there was to know about her. And, uh, when I left my band, kind of my, you know, breaking up with my, the girl I thought I was going to marry band, uh, her band asked me to come and, and sing for them. And I, I accepted and her and I were just really, really good friends during the whole time we were in that band together and we both left around the same kind of six month to year period and then stayed in touch. And I, when I had a show at a coffee shop, I asked her to play piano and, and sing with me and she did. And then that was sort of the beginning of uh, me slowly waking up to the idea that I was also in love with her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, very cool. And she was, yeah, yeah. So then you moved to Texas. You guys kept yep. in touch, and you were sending what songs back and forth to each other. Yeah, yeah. And then how did you get the rest of the people in, in the branches, and uh, you know, put that first? Is the first record you put out home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, tell me about that that album and 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 how. 
you know, you got the other members and how, how that came together. Yeah. So we, so when I moved down, I met a guy named David Dennison at the church. Uh, I, I started going to on Sundays. My sister had told me I should, I should meet this guy. She thought we'd need two peas in the pod. And so I went to this like youth service and I saw him play drums and was like, yeah, we need to be in a room together with loud amplifiers. And, and I want to see what <laughs> can happen with this dude. And I just remember jamming with him and, and feeling like as far as the drummers that I had played with up until that point in my life, that was the first time it felt like the sky cracked open and a pure unadulterated like magic flooded the room and and we both knew it. it there was just there was something sacred about that like we'd both been dead our entire lives and somebody like resurrected us and woke us up and was like thou shalt play music <laughs> um and so from that from that first jam session i mean there was just never any doubt in my mind we had something truly special and he pulled in his buddy who he uh played bass with he was, he was an extraordinary bass player, uh, Jacob Burkhart. And we started rehearsing. It was like, well, we need a guitar player, which we didn't find for a while. So we were just a four piece and I played electric. Hmm. Shannon flew down. You would think the guitarist would and, probably be the easier one to find. <laughs> yeah. You know what exactly. I mean? Like the drummer is always usually yeah. the guy. Like the drummer's in like nine bands, <laughs> but not the, exactly. the guitar players. Yeah, and we, for the life of us, and we were about an hour north of Dallas, and we just could not pin anybody down. And we just, we just stayed a four piece. Figured we, we, you know, we'd kind of figure it out. And we got up to Michigan and and met a guy named Josh Smith. Who be kind of throughout every record we've ever made, there's always been sort of this like Obi Wan Kenobi big brother who sort of the universe is sort of like provides for us you know our first record was josh smith and he was a worship leader at another church he's the guy that i, I did those demos with probably a couple of years before and he was an insane guitar player so we we started playing shows and he played with us and he recorded our first ep played lead guitar on our first album did all the pre-production for the first record as well we, I mean, and we really sweated it out. Um, and so that was, the, that was kind of the core band. And then things, you know, as they always do, you know, kind of just slowly started to fall apart mm -hmm. in that we, we got a lot of record deals, but we just, we decided not to sign any of them because we didn't want to give up our masters and we didn't want to give up our publishing. And so you know, there's good money if you can land a good record deal and get a big advance. But we we kind of came into the industry and started about two years before Spotify came into play. So we had like a couple of years of touring and selling like 50 CDs a night mm -hmm. and making like 500 to a thousand dollars a night and like just just in CD sales. Wow. Um, yeah, it was crazy. So good, great, great money. And things like really started happening, but we, we just thought, well, let's own our masters. Let's own all of our music. And we'll just kind of keep going and keep going until we, we feel like the time is right. But there wasn't a lot of money to go around. We were all still working other jobs. And um, our bass player, Burke, decided to, to kind of move on, go back to school, get married. David stuck with us for about another year and a half and then left for seminary. So when our, when our second record was made, it was it was written during a time where I had, I was really struggling to accept the fact that what we started, you know, was a four piece band, and that's all I ever wanted it to be. I didn't want anyone to go. I, I that that's the band that I wanted. We were we were a, a special special piece, uh, but our second record. It kind of taught me to let go of that narrative and, and, and help both Shannon and myself realize we're a, we're a band that is fronted by Shannon and I. We're kind of like the duo, 
And then we have this rotating, rotating cast of like really, really close friends that are just available to play. Um, and once we accepted that, um, you know, fast forward a few years later, we're now on our third album. And as we've just kind of embraced, like whoever can play with us, will play with us. And pull. we've had this band with us for a year now. And uh, they're incredible guys. They're all high caliber musicians out of Charlotte, North Carolina. They play for John Mark McMillan and uh, a few other really, really, really great bands. And um, so we just try to take good care of them and, and, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, no, that's I I love it. So good. So so home was the one that started attracting attention from record labels and stuff, you said. Yep, yep. And like labels were like the majors, like who was coming and, and knocking at your door and how are yeah, you? Yeah, we're talking to Col- Columbia. Wow. Um which was crazy, you know. Um and Tooth and Nail, Mono versus Stereo, um, a subsidiary of Capital, and uh, a few others, and uh, we just we just walked. And then when it came time to make our second record, we had um, another uh, Tooth and Nail kind of came back around again. It still just didn't didn't feel right. Um, and we, we, so we just, we passed again. And, um, and then the third, third time around, we weren't, we weren't really sure anyone would, you know, would care. We had kind of been through a lot of stuff. It'd been about five years since we put an album out. Both my wife and I at that time were considering just kind of, you know, selling the assets and, I was going to go back to school to, to become a counselor and, and, and completely change my, my life path. And, um, I just on a whim, I sent these, these songs that we'd recorded to Brandon Ebel from tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. And maybe three weeks later, I got a call from Adam Scatula, who's our, our A and R guy and said, you know, I I listened to the new demos. I think they're the best songs you've you've written to date. To date, and we really want to be a part of it. And it's like, all right, dude, you've been trying to get me to to go on a date with you for for three albums now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna at least hear you out, you know. And uh-huh. um, and you know, the, you know, for us is history. You know, we we did the deal, and I literally was texting him today, just saying, "Hey, man, thankful for you, and I hope you're well." So it. It just feels like family, you know, and um, they've done a great job at creating, you know, momentum for uh, for our band. And, um, you know, we were just really, really thankful for for our team. Mm -hmm. What was the decision um, on the third record to decide to go with Tooth and Nail? Like, yeah, I would say that the big one was the the marketing machine mm-hmm. you know having so you know, tooth and nail has developed incredible acts over the last you know 20 years oh, yeah. it's, it's kind of crazy level. but they've been <laughs> around yeah like they've they've done an, done amazing amazing work and you know i think they've done a great job of navigating the the way the industry has ebbed and flow throughout ebbed and flowed throughout the years and we just, we were kind of tapped out. We felt like, you know, we did our job really well, which is making a record we were proud of and and couldn't wait to share with people. But in terms of knowing how to market it and tell a compelling story and win new fans, we didn't know how to do that. It's like, we'll, we'll go out on tour. We can go do that, you know, but that's our booking agent's job and our manager's job to kind of sort that stuff out. But we just didn't really know how to market and tell a great story. And, and they did, they really did. And um, so that was the, that was the appealing thing is to kind of give our music and put our music in the hands of, of people who really cared about creating a platform for, for, uh, you know, the artists they believed in. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and they've had some major, major artists over the years as well, Tooth and Nail. Yeah. I mean, that must be a really cool... It was probably pretty, you know, gratifying to sign with them after the third third album, I'm sure. Absolutely, you know, and, and there's a lot of nostalgia tied to it. You know, the bands that I grew up emulating and, and wanting to be are, are, you know, were bands like Brand New... Oh, and yeah. love that band. You know, Me Without You and Manchester Orchestra and mm-hmm. um you know Under Oath and As Cities Burn, you know, like the that that whole scene. Yeah. Like I was born out of that scene, mm-hmm. you know, and uh so it feels in a in a strange way, like our band is now kind of picking up where some of those bands left off and uh trying to carry that that kind of that torch forward of you know not not being ashamed about you know the particular way in which you view the world um but doing it artistically you know Mm -hmm. so so the most recent record that you guys just put out last year that that's the one on Mm -hmm. tooth and nail when we were in love yep when we were in love yep yep. very cool and did you guys have a chance to tour on that album at all or was everything kind of shut down by that point we did, thank God. Yeah, we did. We did a full, full tour on that on that album that was supposed to go out west this spring, and that was canceled by our friend COVID nineteen. Ah, um, yes. But 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 before but before that, yeah, we we had got a lot of dates in. So um, we're we're kind of riding off in the sunset from that record. Now we just dropped a. Um, a, a new song, but I, I, I look back on uh, when we're in love and just the last couple of years, and yeah, I mean, it, it just feels like a dream, and, and it's very apparent to me that so much of what's happened wouldn't wouldn't have happened without just a good label partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the new song that's out is called "Gonna Get Through This." What, it, what mm-hmm. what's that song about? Tell me about that song. Yeah, quarantine, you know, and, and I, I, <laughs> I, I hesitated. I was so nervous, you know, just like, do I want to be just like another guy who sounds like he's trying to like capitalize on quarantine? Um, but I, I was also, you know, deeply affected by the aftermath of this and seeing, you know, friends of mine, you know, seeing, you know, we're here in Nashville, there's like our, a breakfast spots that that we like to go to one of which we found out closed Mm -hmm. um you know and those are these are young people starting businesses trying to provide their for their families like we're all trying to do and and because of the virus you know their this business that they're passionate about is dead um you know and and hearing about friends and family and loved ones dying right um, all that, that was traumatic. Um, but yet at the same time, we had friends who had babies and, you know, nieces and, and, uh, you know, and, and young friends who have, you know, graduated college and, you know, my niece this Saturday is getting married. So it felt like this weird yin and yang where there's like deep, 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 deep pockets of sorrow. And yet in spite of all of that, uh, you know, flowers were still kind of growing up out of all of those ashes. So I wanted to write, you know, something that acknowledged what felt, you know, the, the desperation of the time that we're in, but also offered hope, which isn't, I mean, uh, sometimes it's, it feels cheesy to offer hope, right? Because you don't want to sound like some, like, white guy in Nashville with a savior complex. Sure. Um, but 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 it was more like offering uh, a reminder to myself, like, don't lose hope, dude. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and hopefully to some other folks as well. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I mean, I, it's nuts to think that no one ever would have thought of this that we'd be going through this. You know, like six months ago. It's so crazy. Yeah. 
Well, Mike, dude, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I really, really appreciate it. I have one more question for you. I want to know if you have any advice yeah. for aspiring artists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, focus on the songs. Focus on the songs. You know, I, I I get a lot of young artists coming up to me and saying like, how do you get a manager? How do you get a record label? How do you book shows? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like how do I get to where you are? And, and I always just, just want to say like, just, just write, write songs every day. Um, because ultimately, you know, we could be, we could have a million dollars in our bank account and, uh, you know, all of the, you know, the, um, the best marketing team that money has to buy, but if our songs suck, it 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 just isn't going to work, you know. And so everything that that we have uh, has been built upon my nearly daily devotion to to writing songs. And and as I've done that day in day out, year after year after year, uh, I've gotten better at it. Um, and so that, that like you know, people are always kind of like, "What's the secret?" And it's like the, there is no secret. It's like the same as you know, if you want to be good at football, you got to show up to practice and it's going to suck sometimes. Yeah. Um, but if you get really good, then, then the scouts will come. And, and uh, so that, that's been, that's been my, my mantra from day one. And then I would also add to that, let the writing and, and the thing that you really love to do, like, let that be what brings you joy, not the outcome. Uh, let the creation of the song and the art, um, let that be where you truly find your, your joy and your peace. And, and then as far as once it gets out into the world and marketed, let, let that worry about itself. It could blow up and be the next big thing or no one could care. And either way, it doesn't matter. You just got to create for the sake of creating. 